I've got a question for you this morning, right out of the gate. Do you want to change the world? I know we, we hear that question a lot. We hear, you know, as we're little kids, you know, the age of all those kids who just took off out there, or when we're middle school, high school, we hear the question, or we, we hear the statement, you're going to change the world. Your generation is going to change the world. So I'm asking you now, since most of us in this room at this point, not all of us, we've got some right down here in different spots throughout that are, you're still in that age range where you're hearing that over and over again, that you're going to change the world. I want to ask the rest of you in this room, do you want to change the world? Or have you gotten to a point, have I gotten to a point where we kind of, we're like, you know what, at this point, I'm just going to let the world do what the world wants to do. I'm just going to. I'm just going to, you know, skate right by on this one. I've gotten to the point in my life where I don't want to make waves. I just want to make it through. Where do you land? Do you want to change the world? Whether or not we change the world is going to come down to how bold we are willing to be. So my second question for you this morning is, how bold are you? On a scale of 1 to 10, and I'll even let you make up your own scale here for just a little bit. I'll, I'll give you the, the 1 is like the bubble boy mentality. Like this is the, I'm going to wrap myself up in plastic wrap, and I'm going to make sure that I don't get hurt by anything emotionally, physically, spiritually. Like I'm going to try and do my best to stay away from anything that could cause any kind of harm to myself. Or you put your own 10 out there for now. We're, I'm going to give you some tens here in a second, but I want you to define that for yourself. How bold on a scale of one to ten are you? Turn to somebody near you and just give them your idea of where your scale of one to ten boldness is. And for all of you in the room are like, there is no way I'm turning near somebody and telling them, I would say your boldness level is probably going to be in the one to three zone. See what I did there? (laughs) Boldness, uh, it, you can find a lot of different definitions for it, but the definition that we're going to work off of this morning, thank you, by the way, for those of you who are like, okay, I'm, I'm at least a four. I can at least turn and, and say this to somebody nearby me who loves me and cares about me and isn't going to judge me and most likely already probably knows where I land on this scale. But anyway, that's, that's beside the point. Boldness, the definition that we are going to use this morning is the courage to act or speak fearlessly despite real or imagined dangers. It is the courage to act or speak dangerously, fearlessly, sorry, despite real or imagined danger. So no matter what I think might be out there, no matter what I think might happen based on what it is that I'm going to do here, I am willing, if I'm a 10, I am willing to put myself out there and to speak up when I need to without fear to act without fear when I need to. Now, to be clear, we are not talking about aggressiveness. We are not talking about being rash or brash. We are not talking about being rude. We are talking about, when appropriate, being willing to speak up and to stand up and to act in a way that there may be some danger that comes to me. It may be a physical danger, it may be a, an emotional danger, it may be uh, somebody attacking my reputation, but I am willing to, in those moments, act or speak fearlessly regardless of what may happen to me. A couple examples for you. There is a man by the name of John Scully. I don't know, some of you who are um, more into that little device that has the, uh, the apple with the bite taken out of it. Never mind that that's what happened in Genesis chapter 1 and you're all carrying that around in your pocket. But anyway, uh, that, that little device that has that symbol on it, the apple. John Scully, back in the early days of Apple, was approached by a man by the name of Steve Jobs to come and work at a company called Apple. But at the time, John Scully had a really good job. John Scully was the president of PepsiCo, which was a pretty big boom in business at the time. They were starting to take on Coca-Cola at the time as the, we want to be the premier soda pop, 
whatever you want to call it, beverage in the United States and in the world, and they were making ground. Personally, I think they passed them. Pepsi is way better than Coca-Cola. For all of those of you who disagree with me, I will continue to pray for you. But he was, he was the president of this company, and it was a big deal. And he turned Steve Jobs down at first. He said, no, I'm not going over there. I'm, I'm doing really good where I am. We're making all this ground. And Steve Jobs looked at him and said, do you want to make sugared water? Or do you want to change the world? John Scully took the job, and he became the CEO of Apple. And as we look at our world today, I think it is pretty obvious that Apple has changed our world. Now, we can get into all sorts of conversations about whether Apple has changed it for better or good, but Apple has changed our world. John Scully had to make the bold decision to leave a comfortable position where he was and instead to go over to a, this might work, but it also might not. And he chose to make the bold decision to go over and join a company that absolutely changed. Now, you could say Pepsi has changed the world too. But I think it's a pretty easy argument to say that Apple has changed it more and formed it more to the point that Pepsi now pays to advertise on Apple products. I mean, just stop and let that sink in for a second. Or a man by the name of Desmond Dross, that most people hadn't really heard of this guy who made some bold decisions until a movie came out a few years ago directed by Mel Gibson called Hacksaw Ridge. Desmond Dross was the, the, uh, the man in the movie, the main character in the movie, who in World War II was a conscientious objector to carrying a gun and to firing a gun. And you can bet that doesn't go over real well when you're in the military and you're in wartime and you're being trained and you've got people screaming at you, telling you that you need to go out and you need to kill the enemy. And the way to kill the enemy is with a gun. And he stood firm in the face of the opposition, in the face of the ridicule, and said, I will not carry a gun. No matter what tactics they tried to make him do it, he said, I will not carry a gun. And it had to do with his faith, which didn't help the matter any. You can go and watch the movie, although I will warn you, there's a lot of blood and there's a fair amount of language in it. It's, a true, it's based on a true story. But the gist of it is, he changed the world without carrying a gun. He changed the world by being bold and sticking to the things that he believed in, even though there was danger that could be brought his way. Physical danger for sure. When you run into battle and you don't have a weapon to fight back, there is absolutely the risk of physical danger, but the emotional danger that he was under as well the reputational danger that he was under as well. But he stuck to his, ironically, to his guns and didn't carry his gun. He was bold. I would put him at a 9 or a 10. Because when you're in the military and you are willing to stick to it that strongly, especially at that time in the military's history, you're being a bold person. Or what about if we go back even further and we go back into the very first century, all the way back to the very beginning of the church. If you want to open up to Acts chapter 4, you can see a story of men who acted boldly and courageously, who stood and acted and spoke up fearlessly in the face of very real danger. Two men by the name of Peter and John have been arrested. And the whole reason that they've been arrested at this point is because they were talking about a resurrected Jesus, something that we can fairly safely still do in most places in America. I won't say everywhere, but most places in America, we can still pretty safely say that. In fact, if you look at Acts chapter 4 and verse 2, it describes they were arrested because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. That's why they were arrested. For the very same thing, that I do here every single Sunday. For the very same reason that we come together on Easter morning 
to celebrate the resurrection of the dead that we can come in here and confidently and safely do, they were arrested and put on trial for it. That was the life that they were living in. Now, we're going to see as we continue on that there was a little bit more going on in the story because they also did the, the ridiculous thing, the horrible thing of healing a man who couldn't walk. How atrocious can you get to heal somebody? But you see, it was offending the wrong people, and it was upsetting the wrong people, and so they were arrested for that reason, for proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus and speaking in his name. And the, the high priest and the court come together, and they begin to start talking, and you can see in their conversation, they realize we've got nothing. There is nothing we have to hold these guys on, but we really, really, really don't want them to do this because this is really messing up our plans. They're talking about this Jesus guy, and he was always talking about how we were wrong, and, and we didn't like that very much. It kind of hurt our feelings a little bit. And so they, they finally, they bring Peter and John in, and Peter and John get a chance to speak. And in Acts chapter 4 and verse 8, we read these words, that then Peter... Filled with the Holy Spirit. And he begins to share some pretty bold words with him. But I don't want us to miss that part of it. Was Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Not Peter with a really good defense that he had worked up while he was sitting in prison. Not Peter who was really, really offended that they had treated him the way that they had. Not Peter who was ready to put them in their place. Not Peter who was tired of being mistreated. Peter who was filled with the Holy Spirit. That might be a piece that we tend to miss when we're considering whether or not we have the boldness to do the things that Peter and John are doing in this story. Is are we filled with the Holy Spirit or are we just filled with being really upset? Really angry that they're trying to make us do these things that they're trying to make us do. Or, or really annoyed that my preferences aren't being acted out all over the world around me. Are we filled with the Holy Spirit or are we filled with ourselves? So Peter begins to boldly tell them some things that when you're being accused of something by people who are in power, I mean, these aren't just, you know, people who are, this isn't like you come in here and I call you in here as a pastor who really, I don't have a lot of legal authority. In fact, I'm not sure I have any legal authority for most things. But for me to call you in here and to correct you and tell you to stop doing things, no, these people had real legal legs to stand on. These people could really make life miserable for Peter and John. And so many times, if I'm putting myself in this story, when I'm faced with that opportunity, that's when I start thinking, okay, how can I soften what it is that I'm going to, that I feel like I need to say. How do I say this to them in a way that won't make them too angry? How can I say this to them in a way that won't offend them? God, I get that this is what you want me to say, but can you rephrase that in a way that isn't going to get me in trouble so that I don't really have to be bold in this moment? I don't want to be rude. I don't want to be aggressive. I don't want to be brash. I don't want to be me. I want to be you in this moment, but can you please make you in a way that will be more like them so that they're not upset with me? But instead, Peter, who is filled with the Holy Spirit, begins to look at them and he begins to say, okay, here's what you're upset at us about. Let's just put it on the table. We healed a man. And that upsets you, that we healed a man. And we healed this man in the name of Jesus. And then he delivers this line to them. Whom you crucified. In other words, we healed him in the name of a man that you senselessly murdered. You know 
you didn't have a leg to stand on when you made that crowd get all riled up so that they would, they would call for his crucifixion and his death. You know what you did. That's the man that we're still following today because that man is still in power. Because that man rose from the dead. Peter didn't make it at all about himself in this moment. It wasn't a, hey, you know what? You, you can't treat me. This isn't fair. You're not treating me with human decency right now. Now he just told him this is how we did it. And this is why we're doing what we're doing. And we can not be silent. And as he boldly says these words to them, as he doesn't fear what's going to happen to him as a consequence of all this, we read in, in verse 13 that the members of the council, this is one of my, if I have a favorite verse, this is one of my favorite verses in all of scripture. It says that then the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. They were amazed when they heard these words for they could see that they were men who had been with Jesus. They could see that these are just ordinary dudes. There is no reason that these guys should have the wisdom that they have, that they should have the boldness to stand up to people like us. Like we are the authority and they are not afraid of us. There is something wrong here. They have a boldness that is, I don't like it. I don't like what they're saying to me, but I have to respect it. In fact, I am straight up amazed by it. And we can tell that they've actually been with this person who rose from the dead. That in and of itself is an admission that they understand that this happened and that they have nothing to stand on. And I ask the same question that I, that I mentioned earlier, or I, I pose the same possible problem, maybe that's a better way to say it, that when Peter spoke with the Holy Spirit, that maybe some of the reason that we aren't as bold and we don't have the words to say in the time we need to say them is because we haven't been with Jesus. Maybe we've read a book that somebody wrote. But have we been with Jesus? A buddy of mine recently told a story about when he was in, I believe it was in India, several years ago, probably about a decade ago. And there was a moment while he was there and he saw a person who was sick and who was begging. And he had this moment where he, he was wrestling with himself should I go over there and essentially say those same words that Peter and John say in chapter 3 of Acts that have gotten them in all this hot water? Stand up and walk, for you are healed. And he had this big struggle in his own mind of, is this because I'm supposed to do this? Because we've been promised that we will be able to do things even greater than what Jesus did? Or is this, I really just want to look good. And I really hope the person actually stands up. Or am I just like, have I eaten too much food that I'm not used to while I'm over here in India? Long story short, when it all came down to it, he didn't do it. And to this day, he still wonders was that the spirit? Was that Jesus telling me, no, go over and tell that person to stand up and to walk? And I wasn't bold enough to do it because my relationship with Jesus isn't that secure that I knew whether or not that was him telling me to do that. Peter and John, I get it. They had the benefit of walking physically with Jesus. They had the benefit of seeing him after the resurrection. They had those things that, that we don't have. We've not physically walked with him. We have not physically seen him stand in front of us and speak to us. We weren't in the upper room when the Spirit came through at Pentecost. We didn't experience those things that way. But if we're to believe that any of this is true, 
If we're to believe the song that we sang just a little bit ago about the goodness of God, then we are proclaiming that we believe that we can be with Jesus still today. And so maybe this isn't one of those, if you pray for healing and it doesn't happen, then your faith just wasn't good enough things. That's not what I'm saying here. But maybe some of the reason that we lack the boldness that they had in Acts chapter 4 is because we don't walk with the Holy Spirit and we don't really spend time with Jesus. I can't speak for you. But I can tell you from myself that I wish that my relationship with him was stronger. And I know I need to spend more time with him. I know that I need to to understand what it means to literally live every moment of every day with him. Not just before meals, not just before bed, not just Sunday morning and Wednesday night, not just when I'm in the office, but literally every moment is with him. And the thing that that stinks about even saying that in front of you all is like, if I wish that that would happen, why don't I do it? And I don't know. Probably because there's still a lot of me in here that I haven't given to him. But they were recognized as just ordinary men. Now, I don't know how many times I've used the statement myself or I've heard other people use the statement of, well, I don't know what to say in those situations. I I haven't studied up on this conversation enough. I don't know how to do this. I don't know what to do at that point. Church, if we would spend our time with Jesus, and if we would understand that every moment is meant to be with Jesus, not just in the moments where we study about Jesus, but if we spend our time with Jesus, then we will be able to stop living in fear of those moments. We will get to the point where our response in those moments is like they said in Acts chapter 4, verse 20, when they said, we can't help speaking about what we've seen and heard. That is, the threats are being thrown on them and they're being told, okay, we're gonna let you go because we realize we have nothing. But please stop doing this because this is really annoying that you're doing this. In fact, if you do this again, we're gonna put you right back in here and we're gonna make it worse next time. And they look at them and they say, look, we we can't help it. You're not gonna keep us quiet. If you let us go, we're just telling you right now, We're going to go out and we're going to do the same thing all over again because we can't help speaking about this. Because it flows out of us. Because we spend every moment with Jesus because we have the Holy Spirit in us and we can't just set that aside. What if we got to that point where we can't help but speak about him? Where we can't help it that when people look at us, they see him. So anyway, these bold men who are definitely a 10, maybe a 12 on a scale of 1 to 10, they go back, they get released, and they go back out. And the first thing they do is they find all the cameras that CNN and Fox News have to offer. And they start to talk about how they were mistreated while they were in prison. Because all they did was go out there and do a good thing. And they got mistreated. And it was horrible. It was a horrible experience. These are horrible people. Oh, no, wait, that's what we do in 2022 when we get persecuted. We make sure that the other side looks really, really bad. No, they went back, and they found the people they were closest to, and they explained to them what had happened. But not in the sense of they're horrible, horrible people, but from the standpoint of, hey, I want to tell you what Jesus did. I want to tell you what the Spirit did. And here's what they said. Like, the threats came. And then this prayer happens, this amazing prayer happens where the, the, the people that they're talking to and Peter and John, they're all praying this prayer and they're just walking through it. Like, hey, this is what it used to be like. This is what it was like when, when the people of God were being attacked and now it's happening right here in this city. It's happening right here in 2022. But I think 
one of the differences is now we pray, God, please make this stop. Please make them stop mistreating us, whereas their prayer was, God, give us boldness to stand in the face of all the things that are coming at us. Not, God, please make it go away. God, prepare me for the battle that happens each and every day. We hear their threats, but give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. That was their prayer. Not make their threats stop. Not, God, eliminate our enemies. God, give us boldness in the face of the people who are bringing this at us. In the face of the spiritual army that is bringing this at us, give us boldness here. My prayer isn't God change them. My prayer is God change me so that I'm prepared for this, so that I can walk with you in each and every moment. And in verse 31, it says, after this prayer, the meeting place shook, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And then they preached the word of God with boldness. I gotta be honest with you, I read a story like that from the early church and their experience, and again, I understand they had the benefit of walking with Jesus physically. I'm not denying that at all. I understand they were a lot closer to the beginning of it in the first place. But I read a story like that, and honestly, I come away and I think our version of boldness is pretty weak. The boldness that we often talk about, the, the risks that we often talk about taking, they're pretty weak. Not to take anything away from, you know, my daughter got up here last week and she sang up here and we've had other young people come up here and sing and I hear the, the comments of they are so bold for getting up there. And I think there's a difference between bravery and boldness. They are brave for getting up here. But boldness. Is there some risk? Yes. Maybe. But to stand up in front of people who love you and who are going to, to encourage you and support you, I think if we begin to teach our children that boldness is to make sure that you have people build you up, then we're weakening what boldness is. Or I've heard the comment several times that it was pretty bold to ride on the walls in the back of the sanctuary. Now, was there some risk that I wouldn't have a job anymore? Maybe. Although I felt like I had the support of enough people that I was pretty safe in that assumption, that we were going to be okay. Was it, was it something different? Yes. But we were amongst loved ones. There wasn't anyone that was going to, at least to my knowledge, that was going to pull out their 9 millimeter and start firing away because I, we pulled out some Sharpies and wrote on the back wall. At least it didn't happen, so I'm assuming that that wasn't really a risk in the first place. I'm not saying that, that some of these things that we do don't require some courage, don't require some bravery, but... But let's not weaken what it means to be bold. Let's, as we go out and we do this, we have to be prepared to stand against the butts because they're gonna come. But I might lose my job. Desmond Dross had the chance of losing his job and he stood with what he believed he was supposed to do. But I might lose my friends. We just had a great conversation yesterday morning around our breakfast table or lunch table or whatever table it was. I don't remember which one we were doing at the time. Because one of our children was accused of, of being something at school that she's not. Because of her faith, she was accused of something at school that she's not and she was at risk of losing her friends. And so we had this great conversation of what it means to love people, what it means to 
to be able to share truth with people, but what it also means that no matter how much you love and no matter how truthful you are, you're sometimes gonna lose friends over the deal. And you're gonna make some straight up enemies over the deal. But we live in a world where what we often see is just don't say anything. Just don't make anybody upset. Just don't offend anybody. And again, I'm not saying be rude, and I'm not saying be aggressive, and I'm not saying being rash. But do we live in a world where we're bold, or do we live in a world where we live in the land of the butts? But I might get fired, but I might lose my friends. I might lose my reputation. But I might get put into a situation where I don't really even know what to do. I don't know what the response is at this moment. But when God's calling me to give that to that person, they might use it for something that I didn't intend for them to use it for. But, 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 and we come up with all these buts. And in the long run, what we do is absolutely nothing. And we cower away and we play it safe. I was just thinking this morning as I was driving into, into Washington to get Sarah's coffee this morning, I was thinking about this story in Acts chapter 4, and I was thinking about what came before it. And, you know, Peter and John, they go up to that man who's, who's ill, who's lame, who hasn't been able to walk since birth, and he's asking them for money. And their response is, I don't have silver or gold, but what I do have, I freely give you. Get up and walk. And I kind of wondered if maybe we've gotten to the point where our response is, what I have for you, I can't help you get healed, but I can give you money. Because that takes a little bit less courage to give you five bucks than it does to really get into your life and help you in this situation. And I know what's going to happen because this happened last time I talked about something like this. And I'm going to have a situation later today where I'm going to have to choose to be bold or choose to run. Because God loves to do that to the pastor when he talks about something like this or she talks about something like this. It's like, hey, here's your opportunity to live it out. Church, we can't just live in the buzz. We can't live in the weakness. And we have to stop living in the past boldness. What the early church did was amazing. And they lived a bold and courageous life. But we can't stake our claim on their boldness. And I would even say that we as a congregation, we can't stake our claim on the boldness of this congregation from 20 years ago. Or 10 years ago. Or five years ago. God has called us sitting in this room today to live boldly. I believe that it was a bold moment when there was a decision made to send a bus out to go pick up a bunch of kids so that they could get here on a Wednesday night. Was there a risk of people pushing back against the church? Probably lower than there would be on some other things. But was there a risk that, that danger, that, that accusations could be made? Yes. Was there a risk that, that physical harm could happen? Yes. Was there a risk that we would be committed to doing this for the next tens and twenties and thirties and however many years? Yes. But it was done anyway. Because rather than sit there and think through all of the buts, it was a no, it's time to do something. We can't continue to just live in that moment of boldness, though. We have to continue to move forward with new actions of boldness. We can't, as Paul would say it, stay babies in our faith and stay babies in our boldness. And that's so often what we do. We teach children... This is what it means to be bold. And at their age, that may be what it means to be bold. But then we stay with that level as we get older and as we grow in our faith. And when there's actually real and inherent risk, we revert back to where we were as children. Paul writes this to the church in Corinth. He says, dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk to you as though you belonged to this world, 
or as though you were infants in Christ, I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. And the scary thing is I think many times he can look at us, and I'm not saying you, I'm saying us, he could look at us and still give this last line and say, and you still aren't ready. You still aren't ready for anything stronger. You still aren't ready to live in the bold life that you've been called to live in. And so you continue to eat the baby milk. When the adult teeth grow in, you're able to start eating the real food. You, you get the good stuff. In our faith, here's the beautiful part of all of this. In our faith, as we choose to grow, as we choose to walk with Jesus each and every day, to be identified as people who walk with Jesus, as we choose to live with the Holy Spirit, as we choose to boldly pursue God and introduce other people to Jesus, as we choose to do those things... As we grow in our faith, our boldness then grows, and the reward that goes with it is great. Look at this in Galatians. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, it says, So let's not get tired of doing what is good, because at just the right time, this, one should, this should land home really well here in southern Indiana, we will reap the harvest. If we don't give up. At just the right time, we will reap the harvest of blessing if we don't give up. If we, will, if we will walk through in the midst of the things that are coming at us, if we will live a bold life, if we will step forward, if we will stand up, if we will stop saying, oh, they told me not to. If we will honestly, let me, let me put it this way. This one should also land in the world in which we live. If we will stand as boldly in our faith, and for Jesus, and talking about him as we stand either for or against a vaccine, then I think the word of God is going to get out to people. And we are going to introduce people to Jesus. Because I tell you what, people have no problems giving you their vocal opinion about a vaccine. But man, when they say don't talk about Jesus, we say, whoop, whoop, whoop. Sorry, didn't mean to offend you. Oh, you disagree with me about the vaccines? Let me tell you all the reasons you're wrong. What if we took not the, the rudeness and the brashness and the aggressiveness from that conversation about a vaccine and just took the boldness from it and we applied that to our faith? Then I believe that you will and we will reap a harvest of blessing and a rich and bountiful harvest. I believe I was told last year was like a record-setting harvest for corn around here, right? Farmers, yes, no, yeah? Yeah. We can reap a harvest like that if we will go out, if we will spend the kind of effort in our walk with Jesus as it takes to, to work a field and to to spray a field and to plant a field and to harvest a field and to sell the grain that comes from the field, if we will put that kind of effort into our relationship with Jesus and walk with him, then here's what I think will happen. We will change the world. In the early church, way back in Acts chapter four, verse, you know, chapter four, chapter three, chapter two, chapter one, Way back then, they changed the world that they were living in. In fact, what I didn't read to you in Acts chapter 4 in the very beginning is that as they were arrested, it actually says the word was already out. It was too late. People had already heard. Peter and John's message was already out there. The message of Jesus was already out there. It says 5,000 people believers were added that day. Now, here in this area, 5,000 people is a lot of people. We have 200-ish here on a Sunday morning. 
Imagine if all 200 of us went out and boldly lived the way that Peter and John lived. Two men, 5,000 people. Well, but, but our world's different than their world was back then. They got thrown in prison, church. They got beaten, church. They got threatened, church. You're right, our world is different. We have freedoms. They didn't have them. Well, they're infringing on our freedoms. They didn't have them. I might lose my freedom. They didn't have them. But yet they live boldly and they change the world and we can too. Do you want to change the world? If you want to change the world, then I invite you this morning to pray a dangerous prayer. Make us bold. You're not going to do it just because you decided this morning that you wanted to do it. Your willpower will run out probably by about 2 o'clock this afternoon. Just being honest, mine will too. But what if we ask him? What if we believe the words from the songs that we sang earlier and the song we're about to sing? What if we believe those words are true? And we believe that he really is a good and powerful God. And we pray those words to him, those dangerous words, that if we pray them, we have to be ready for our life to change. Our world's gonna change too. It's not changing the world to look like the world I want it to be. It's changing the world, including myself in it, to the world he wants it to be, to the kingdom he wants to be. If we pray that dangerous prayer, make us bold. And we mean it, and we continue to pray it, over and over and over again. And when we don't feel the boldness, we pray it again. When we pray that over and over and over again, I believe that he will change the world, but if we're afraid to do it, then the world will change. But it's not gonna change in the way that we know it should. Do you wanna be a part of changing the world? If you do, and here's what I'm gonna ask you to do, and this honestly, this isn't that bold of a request. I'm just being honest. But my hope is that you'll take it seriously to where it is a bold statement that you're making. If you want to change the world and you are willing to pray that prayer this morning, make us bold, then I invite you as we sing this song to stand. And if you're at a point right now where you're like, I'm not at a point where I can do that. Hey, I'm not gonna judge you. And I'm not gonna throw you out of here, partially because I can't, but also because I don't want to. But just, just stay seated for this morning. It's not a shame thing. It's just take that time and wrestle with him. Wrestle with God. Wrestle with yourself. Discover why, why am I hesitant? The people around you, I guess I can't guarantee they won't judge you, but I'll be pretty disappointed if they do for what that's worth. If you're willing to pray that prayer this morning, stand up, pray make us bold.